Hey, G. and hello. It is with gratitude that the original municipality of Wood Buffalo acknowledges this meeting as being hosted on Treaty 8 territory, the ancestral and traditional land of the Cree, Dene, and Métis people. Let this serve as a reminder of our ongoing efforts to recognize, honor, reconcile, and partner with Indigenous peoples whose land and water we benefit from today. We are grateful to live, learn, work, and play in this community and on this territory. I'd like to welcome all of you joining us to what is now the fourth installment of the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo's Indigenous Speaker Series. My name is Janine Cruz, Manager with Indigenous and Rural Relations Department, and tonight I get the honor of being your host for the next hour. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that this event is being recorded and in an effort to avoid any unintentional interruptions, your audio device will be muted for the presentation portion of the evening. If you think of any questions during the conversation tonight, please enter them at any time in the Q&A chat section or text your question to 780-838-3925. In alignment with the seven sacred teachings, we want to create as safe of a space as possible for discussion and learning. We therefore ask everyone to personally commit to being kind in their interactions with one another this evening. We do our best to prepare for these virtual events, but we do ask for your patience if we experience any technical difficulties. I now like to welcome my colleague and my friend, Alison Flett, who will open this evening with a prayer. Allison. Here we go. Oh, sorry guys. Now can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Allison Flett Nitsiga Sun Uchi Nia Mixukri First Nation. Thank you for inviting me to open in a good way and honoring our traditional ways. If you would just please join me in prayer. Natawi Nan Nanaskamund Anuch Miokisagak. Creator. We are grateful to be together on this beautiful day. We are grateful for the time and space created here for us to share, learn, and lift each other. Creator, please guide us to respect one another, to care for one another, and to share kind words together. We give gratitude for the Indigenous way of knowing from our grandmothers and our grandfathers. Creator, we pray for Wakotuin, kinship, to bond us together. We pray for peace and love. We are forever grateful for our connections to the water, the land, the animals, and the people. All my relations. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. So I'm very excited to introduce you to, to tonight's speaker, Carol Ann Hilton. Canada Research Chair for Regional Innovation, Ken Coates, describes our guest tonight as one of the most articulate and creative commentators on Indigenous business and economic development in the country. She does this with a deep understanding of Indigenous cultures that enables her to convey how vital Indigenous economies are to Canada's present and future. A present and future that is filled with entrepreneurial success, Indigenous innovation, resilience, and community determination. As the founder of the Indigenomics Institute and the author of the book titled Indigenomics, Carol Ann's work brings focus and attention to the economic empowerment of Indigenous nations to design their own future as Indigenous peoples. She says it's time to increase the presence, visibility, and role of the emerging modern Indigenous economy. It's time to bring to light and realize the increasing role and responsibility of Indigenous peoples, both within Canada and globally. And so in keeping with that theme, let's get started because it's time to talk with Carol Ann Hilton. Carol Ann, welcome and thank you so much for spending your time with us this evening. I'm going to turn it over to you. Meeting. Hi. Thank you. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you so much for the warm introduction to come and spend time with you today. 
Uklasish Caroline Hilton Heshquiak Supsishu Klaus Wakatush Koatza Umti. I am new channel from the west coast of Vancouver Island and I am from the Heshquiat Nation and I'm signing in from Lekwungen Territory in Victoria, BC today. And just in your introduction, I wanted to um, while we do this virtually, I wanted to uphold uh, the Treaty 8 and the original intentions and the original relationship that um, establishes the continuation of that agreement into our collective reality today. To understand that that intention to continue on, to live a good life and to that that concept of continuing our ways of life are essential in bringing our perspective of being able to understand what we have inherited in our perspective of the indigenous relationship as the founder of the indigenomics institute i can say that it's been no less than an absolute uh, trip to be able to establish a hashtag, be able to move it into shaping meaning and to actually shape it into a movement itself. Some of you might wonder what is this concept of indigenomics and it's been in origin or in movement um, for a number of years now. In authoring, and I'm sorry, I don't I don't want to interrupt you. I do apologize. However, your camera's off and we'd love to be able to see you. So I'm just, uh, if I'm not sure if that's intentional or not, but I do want to let you know that before we continue on. Um, my camera shows us on. Okay, that's our glitch. We'll fix that. Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. Carry on. That's okay. Can you indicate that if it's been fixed? I will as soon as we work on that. Yep. Okay, yep, it says it's on on mine, but let me know if I do need to, uh, to do anything and I don't mind you interrupting at all. Okay. Uh, feedback is coming in that they can see me. Thank you, but I can't. All right, all good then. Carry on. Thank you. Good. Um, so as the author of Indigenomics, uh, taking a seat at the economic table, what was important to me in writing that book was to really have the space to present it into Canadian reality or Canadian consciousness that we have inherited and see through the lens of the Indian problem. And what I mean by that concept of the Indian problem, that the establishment of the Indian Act and the establishment of Canada itself were parallel processes. To understand that essentially the establishment of the reserve systems, the establishment of uh, the residential schools, even right into the establishment of the RCMP, of what we know it as a federal institution today, were all directly uh, results of managing the Indian problem. So to say that that thread of perspective has woven itself through um, over 150 plus years into Canadian reality, the concept of indigenomics itself is intended to be able to reorient the relationship. The word is neutral in the sense that it doesn't come weighted with uh, legal baggage or perception. As a new word, it's intended to be able to bring into visibility the importance of the Indigenous relationship. And in understanding that the core concept of Indigenomics is to be able to bring our understanding and align our action of this concept of Indigenous economic displacement. What I mean by Indigenous economic displacement is that systemic removal from our traditional lands, our traditional ways of being, our language, and even our own worldview. This concept of economic displacement has in itself 
while it seemed that the early policies that shaped Canada, that it seemed a way to manage the Indigenous population. However, what has escaped that and shifted and changed and emerged is this continuity of Indigenous uh, people to understand that essentially our continuation and visibility has shifted through um, beyond the Indian Act itself and created this new modern space. To look at this idea of inheriting the, in, the Indian problem, what is important is to be able to understand the mechanisms with which Indigenous peoples have been economically displaced. To understand that there's an increasing Indigenous economic um, strength today is the foundation of Indigenomics. In its development in shaping meaning to it, what was most important to me was this concept of describing Indigenomics as modern, constructive, generative, Indigenous economic design. So the Indigenous relationship at the foundation of Canada was by design. So to be able to understand that the growth of the Indigenous economy today and to design our economy in our future um, in a more collaborative way is essentially what Indigenous peoples are being set out to do. The other point I wanted to reference is in this concept of the inheritance of the Indian problem. To understand that the language of the Indigenous relationship is often portrayed solely on the cost side of the equation. We look to examples of impact benefit agreement, where we see, again, Indigenous peoples being on the cost side of the equation. Our populations are often referenced within the narrative of problem to un or deficit to understand that essentially the description of the metrics of who we are can be described within this concept of the socioeconomic gap and the cost of that to understand that Indigenous peoples have been relegated to the margins of negative statistics like the highest suicide rates, the lowest education, the highest diabetes, the highest number of youth in care, and on and on and on, these negative reflections of our Indigenous population. So it also serves that the lens with which we look through as indig individuals and the language that has supported or the absence of language in our education of actually understanding the Indigenous relationship, that is where we're at in um, this current modern context. To utilize language as a way to support and advance what it is that we mean and what our intentions are. The concept of the Indigenomics book, what I set out to do was establish in the hashtag Indigenomics, which we can be found on any social media, the hashtag itself was a way to be able to distribute stories of Indigenous business success and the challenges that were happening around that. So in the hashtag Indigenomics, what I set out to do was create this volume of work of the media narrative and to examine the language that was referred to in the Indigenous relationship. To understand that essentially, to tell the story of that experience, whether the creation of the language that supported the current context of the relationship what I identified was the ways that the distinction of an Indigenous worldview was largely absent in that media narrative. To understand that the book itself was shaped to be able to highlight and bring us to essentially spotlight Indigenous worldview, not in a monolithic sense, but to look at similarities and ties of what, what was the construct 
um, of an indigenous worldview and realizing that that worldview was expressed through numerous different languages and experiences. The commonality of that lens of worldview began to shape this concept of indigenomics principles that looked at how we designed our relationships, our ways of life, our ceremonies, and, and those ways of being. In the development of the book itself, what I began to do was to establish a distinction, not only in the worldview, but how Indigenous people experienced wealth and abundance distinctly from what we would see within a mainstream context. An example of that is I describe the work of Orin Lyons, a spiritual leader of um, the Iroquois tradition, who describes that you have tried to make us capitalists ever since you arrived, but we don't value what you value, he describes. And to us understand that distinction comes to what we value. So that perspective of how Indigenous people, what we value, and how that is driven through our worldview is what the book set out to do in its early formation. In its development, what I described was the landscape of the Indigenous economy today, and to begin to point to the development of Canada and the absence of actual understanding of how the Indigenous relationship was managed. To understand that concept of we were never taught this in school, what we're seeing is a generational shift that has been passed down to begin to have students um, better reflect that history and that education of how important that is in rebuilding and designing that relationship. What was important to me in developing the book was to center this idea of this is what has happened to us as people, but then to create an intersection of designed by us, to have Indigenous people empowered of designing our relationship that is the power shift that's been able to be established through the legal means of defining Indigenous rights, defining um, our legal space and how that translates into economic space. The concept of Indian Act economics emerged in the book as a way to also center our understanding of the Indigenous relationship over time. I present the concept of Indian Act economics as a way to demonstrate that there are essentially two types of economy at play within this country. There's economics as we know it, as the fundamental essence of productivity, wealth generation, and the design um, of productivity itself, and the metrics that support that. The second type of economics at play is Indian Act economics, and it has been in play since 1867. To understand that it in its structure was the fundamental tool of economic regression of indigenous people is something that to understand that this is still in play has the structures of economic regression of Indigenous peoples today, whether it, our nations across this country are described as historical treaty, modern treaty, self-governance, or numerous other distinctions. My concept of is introducing Indian Act economics into Canadian consciousness is to relay this concept that essentially Every single Canadian in this country from the start to now and to the continuation of the Indian Act itself has been negatively affected by it. To understand this concept of Indian Act economics, there's numerous, there's, I could spend a couple hours speaking just specifically to some of the elements that still exist in the Indian Act today.
to understand that Canadian recognition in the in the Canadian um, Constitution, the distinction of Indigenous rights and the ability to facilitate that into actual pathways that uphold the Indigenous relationship, that is really what Indigenomics is about. In describing Indian Act economics, what was important to me was to be able to present an alternative that described the structure of Indigenous economic empowerment. To be able to describe, and this is what I drew from the ongoing media narrative, what were the sources, the spaces, the intersections that shaped and formed Indigenous economic empowerment today? So looking at some of those examples, that includes the development of rights and title, the dismantling of um, key features within the Indian Act itself, such as it wasn't until the 1960s that Indigenous peoples were allowed um, to be able to hire lawyers, to be able to leave the reserve without permission, or to be able to even vote. This concept of dismantling the perception and illusion of dependency is something also that I set out to do in the book. To be able to come to terms with that illusion, often based within racist perceptions of Indigenous people, um, that idea of that misunderstanding of whether or how Indigenous people pay taxes, our uh, treaty relationship to education, federal fiscal uh, responsibility, all of those need to be brought into our awareness in new ways that is outside of that construct of the Indian problem that I introduced earlier. To be able to address this dependency illusion, what I set out to do was to shift this concept of the Indian problem to seeing the Indigenous populations as an Indigenous economic powerhouse to see Indigenous peoples as powerful and to establish the shift and the narrative and the language that brought that power play essentially into focus. When we can understand the growth and design of the Indigenous economy and essentially center that within a, a forward-looking trajectory of a $100 billion Indigenous economy, that is what I set out to be able to do to look at how the media describes Indigenous economic and business activity, and then to look at the space that requires new understanding in terms of how we view and perceive the Indigenous relationship. That concept of the Indigenomics toolbox emerged as a way to bridge the space of lack of understanding or lack of access to information to really begin to build a stronger perspective of the continuation of treaty itself, our individual um, role within that, and to be able to, to um, create our relationships equipped with stronger understanding of the most basic formative um, concepts that shape the Indigenous relationship. Going back all the way through to the doctrine of discovery, to concepts like um, the Royal Proclamation, the Constitution, um, the establishment of free prior and informed consent, concepts like just consultation or to look at examples of understanding the federal apology and why that was important and what was said within it. To look at institutions such as the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which told the stories of thousands and thousands and thousands of Indigenous survivors around what actually happened within the residential school.
when we look at the residential schools as a tools of econ as a tool of economic displacement and isolation that is the formative path to begin to bring together new actions towards a positive relationship my work around moving beyond the socioeconomic gap, moving beyond the perceptions of the indigenous relationship and support that with actions and intention. This concept that emerged around the $100 billion indigenous economy in itself is a structure of economic reconciliation. To me, economic reconciliation is really about as a positive outcome must in itself have a positive effect on our indigenous way of life. So when we look at examples of removal from our territories, removal from ways of life, or the right to continue as people, as described within the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, that continuation of way of life has entered into every single court case that Indigenous peoples have won. To be able to understand that that removal or isolation of Indigenous people from our worldview has isolated our inherent sense of responsibility and stewardship and ability to facilitate sustainable actions from a long-term or multi-generational perspective. It's essentially that re-inclusion of Indigenous worldview and role in terms of that stewardship and sustainability, that that is the space for economic reconciliation today. Indigenous peoples are taking our seat at the economic table like never before, in a place in a space that has been so long systematically denied. To understand the structure of the disinvitation of Indigenous peoples to the economic table is the uncomfortable truth that we are at within this country. When we look to examples like the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Fund, to look at that as a way to see that structures, tools, leadership, and convening those towards positive Indigenous economic inclusion, these are the structures that support Indigenomics and the trajectory towards a $100 billion Indigenous economy. My work over these past years in establishing the $100 billion economic target at the 2019 uh, Assembly of First Nations Special Chiefs Assembly, essentially placing into Canadian reality a possibility of Indigenous economic strength that could be measured and aligned across Canadian prosperity. My questions and lines of inquiry of what do we need to do to get ready for a $100 billion Indigenous economy? The response was essentially to establish the a concept of an Indigenomics economic mix, to look at that mix as a series of levers to support the growth and design of the Indigenous economy. Some of those levers included procurement as a tool, or a policy, uh, entrepreneurship, trade, equity ownership, capital, clean energy as some examples. To look at that series of levers as spaces to begin to invest in and to design positive Indigenous economic outcomes, that is really the intention to structure the tools, the resources and the leadership of Indigenous economic design towards a $100 billion Indigenous economy. That concept of bringing our intention of Indigenous economic empowerment and designing pathways for investment and inclusion, that is Indigenomics. To really be able to look at the space of Indigenous peoples have made within Canadian economic reality, we see examples that are dismantling the essentially 
everything that we have been told about the Indigenous relationship to date. To be able to place into our reality the structures of economic design, that is essentially what the work of the Indigenomics Institute has set out to be able to do. Since establishing the 100 billion target and to be in being able to identify the trends and patterns in that, what I have encountered is essentially an increasing pattern of Indigenous economic impact, inclusion, and investment. Examples of that, while we look at that first formation of what I had referred to earlier, is that Alberta Indigenous Opportunity, looking at a billion dollars of structure fund of investment, we see the continuation and pattern Looking to the example of the Federal Infrastructure Fund, we see billion dollars of investment into Indigenous infrastructure. We see this past year examples of the 5% Federal Indigenous Procurement Target, which in itself would express to a, oh, just over a billion dollars of annual Indigenous economic activity. We see examples in Nova Scotia, a, shining demonstration this year of a billion dollar uh, Clearwater deal that outlined investment into Indigenous ownership in the value chain or the value stream of the uh, aqu aquaculture and fisheries uh, sector. We look to numerous other examples. Also in Alberta, we see a group of collective nations um, designing their equity ownership into major infrastructure such as pipelines. Never before have we seen such an increase in Indigenous economic activity and that this shift from impact benefit agreement to equity ownership, the space between those two concepts in itself equity ownership like never before has been situating Indigenous nations as having a seat at the economic table in new ways. Continuing this trend of increasing um, the common pattern of billion dollar Indigenous economic activity, there's numerous other examples, whether we move up north to Ontario, we see the James Bay Cree in billion dollar uh, development multi-sector deals. We see in Vancouver um, billion dollar real estate deals. We see billion dollar participation in the LNG market. All of these begin to establish the formulative context that a hundred billion dollar Indigenous economy is not only possible, but it's already happening. To be able to understand and to place into our response and our leadership in the $100 billion Indigenous economy is the work of the Indigenomics Institute. What is emerging in an external context is increasing forces driving new mechanisms and new behavior around sustainability. We're seeing that in a global context, in particular, the sustainable development goals. We're seeing that in increasing pressures of ESG measurements and national and international targets for net zero. When we can understand that the absence of Indigenous peoples at the economic table and a worldview that supports sustainability multi-generational wealth creation and stewardship to understand the role of Indigenous peoples in these global uh, trends, it becomes essential to look at how we uphold and include the Indigenous perspective within our economy. The concept of Indigenomics has always been about being human-centered. My work has been to be able to demonstrate the language of fear, doubt, and anger, and uncertainty, and how that drives narrative and drives lack of action.
the language of indigenomics is essentially about shifting that towards positive words such as ignite, activate, and empower. To understand this language shift, the imagination to bring a word into possibility or into reality, indigenomics serves as a tool to recenter our relationships towards understanding the importance of the indigenous relationship, not only in Canada, but in each of our provinces. To understand and uphold the indigenous relationship, to recognize and pay attention to where we are seeing Indigenous economic empowerment. That is a central function of economic reconciliation. It's to be able to build our understanding. It's about expanding what it is that we see and understanding what we have inherited in terms of what we see in terms of Indigenous people. It's being able to shift the language of inclusion, of design, and to be able to create the space of shaping the Indigenous relationship for positive outcomes. Outcomes that reflect Indigenous well-being, outcomes that reflect reconciliation, and outcomes that essentially support actions and beliefs to design the tools, the resources, and the structures of an emerging Indigenous economic strength. To be able to see that the Indigenomics taking a seat at the economic table has not even been out a year, it's just under a year now, and to really see the placement of it in terms of who is reading and being able to create new pathways and new behaviors. Seeing the content being reflected within um, business schools, within policy schools, within um, conversations and leadership and community engagement, all of those dynamics have really served to bring forward this concept of indigenomics to be able to create that space between what has happened to us and designing our relationships going forward. That highest intention of indigenomics is to be able to highlight the importance of indigenous perspective and worldview that it's not and cannot be rendered to our past, but how we have carried that Indigenous worldview forward and with it, those responsibilities and Indigenous language that reflect sustainability in a way that the world is trying to grasp of what that actually means in terms of short-term thinking and economic structures that are exclusionary or essentially isolate um, wealth from the population itself. The concept of indigenomics is essentially about, a, originally in my introduction, I had read a series of manifestos and interestingly, the adaptation to the indigenomics manifestation was to be able to shift to cre the creation of Indigenous economic space, to pay attention to the structure of that economic space and the tools, and to be able to reflect that in our relationships. When I wrote the Indigenomics Manifestation, I essentially feel like I downloaded what Indigenomics wanted to become to understand that the indigenous perspective, way of life was embedded within the natural world, within natural law and within responsibility to our next generation and responsibility to carry truths around original teachings and ways of being and relationship. That is the beauty of the indigenous perspective. 
the lens that we have become to see, whether that's unemployment or lack of access to opportunity um, or lack of empowerment, are the effects, in a sense, of the dislocation from that worldview. In having that ability to create the space of what Indigenomics is, those are some of the activities that we look at at the, at the national level to facilitate the $100 billion Indigenous economic trajectory, to facilitate investment into that Indigenomics economic mix, and lastly, to establish the concept of an Indigenomics Economic Freedom Index, to examine the interrelationship between the concept of Indigenous dependency as facilitated through the federal relation, fiscal relationship, the development of own source revenue, and investability itself to look at metrics that are positive and generate Indigenous economic empowerment is the work of the Indigenomics Institute. At a global level, what we're looking to be able to do is to draw on that same concept of the Indigenomics economic mix and to be able to design a global network of facilitating the development of an Indigenous virtual economic market. And to be able to understand that role of uplifting sustainability and multi-generational wealth design, that is the space of Indigenomics to create the platform for the visibility of Indigenous economic strength and to be able to facilitate tools of investment and tools of collaboration and design. That is a lot of what I wanted to be able to present about the development of Indigenomics taking a seat at the economic table and to bring a perspective of centering our economic response, our business relationships and economic reconciliation itself. Again, understanding and paying attention to the media narrative, that is what I wanted to be able to bring forward in the book itself, was the language that's used, the tools and the narrative of Indigenous economic design. My work at the federal level essentially brought into focus my leadership to be able to see and speak to the absence of Indigenous economic design. I essentially posit that the Indigenous economy cannot exist within programs and services, but must instead be centered in relationships, economic empowerment, inclusion, and visibility. That is Indigenomics. My work has constantly been an invitation the question who wants to play Indigenomics has been responded to with the realization of leadership, of language shift, and our ability to respond to seeing Indigenous economic empowerment today as it is, as well as tying that to our own economic prosperity in a region. Thank you again for the invitation to come and spend time with you today. I appreciate the leadership of holding these conversations and the leadership of bringing this perspective together. My appreciation in being invited and thank each one of you for coming out um, this evening and, spend, and choosing to spend your time here. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. It hasn't even been out a year, and uh, that's what you said there. It hasn't even been a year, and it's having the impact that it is on shifting that conversation and really giving us a narrative that is really long overdue. So thank you for uh, going into that detail that you did and, and sharing your work with us this evening. Um, we do have a little bit of time for some questions from the audience, but first we want to give away of your uh, a copy of your wonderful book, Indigenomics, and uh, 
Uh, so we've randomly drawn a name from the participants that are here this evening and Paula Carpenter, if, uh, if you're there, that's you. You've won a copy of Carol Ann's book. So just email uh, participate at rmwb.ca to arrange for pickup. Okay, so uh, just a reminder, we, we did have some questions sent into us beforehand, but if you do have uh, questions, enter them into the chat or you can text them to 780-838-3925. So, um, Carol Ann, just a couple things. In your book, you speak about uh, the concept of wealth from an Indigenous worldview and how that differs from uh, the concept of wealth in the mainstream economic worldview. And um, I was just curious if you could speak about the difference between the two um, and how, how they're vastly different. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think because I come from the New Channel tradition, which is of the potlatch people. One of the demonstrations of that is that core concept of the more you give away, the wealthier you are. And oftentimes we see that across different cultures and regions, the same concept, but different ceremonies that uphold that. So wealth is reinforced through ceremony and wealth is something bigger than something tangible. It's a ability to reflect the nature of reality and to understand different weights of value in terms of what is considered wealth. That idea of the more you give, the more you receive, that concept of value creation is something that is unique to an Indigenous um, culture. And while there's different expressions of that, that concept of ceremony reinforces our relationship and relationship is fundamental to the structure of wealth itself. The concept of multi-generational wealth creation, the questions that we ask are fundamentally distinct within an Indigenous worldview. In understanding that question, how will this affect future generation? That is indigenous economic design. So whether that's resource management, whether that is um, the ability to look at modern businesses in terms of an extraction perspective, having the space for activated indigenous stewardship and responsibility that activation of stewardship and responsibility and wealth and accountability are intrinsically connected where you wouldn't see that within a Western or a mainstream concept of wealth. That was my short answer. Thank you for that short answer. Uh, yeah, the concept of responsibility, I think, is very different the way you outline it in, in your book versus like the common per perception of responsibility as being a negative thing, having these responsibilities, but you identify that within the, the book as being something very positive to have. And so I thought that was really interesting. I don't know if you want to touch on that, too, but uh, yeah. Um, so just oh, I, um, one question that's come in. Um, reconciliation is something that the municipality uh, and we're looking to prioritize and, and talk about. And you talked about bringing it into the collective consciousness and the language of, of, of people. Um, and you talked about an economic reconciliation or even just a reconciliation toolkit in your book and various um, things within that toolkit that people need to have to be able to uh, have the awareness and the understanding to have the conversations. And so I'm just, I was hoping you could touch on that toolkit and what um, having that, you know, everybody has a responsibility for reconciliation. What are some of those things that everybody can have or put in their toolkit to be able to um, have the conversation and advance reconciliation? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Chapter 13 in my book, Building a Toolbox for Economic Reconciliation, talks about inclusivity, uh, pathways, uh, and relationships. And I think for your region to look at structure of economic reconciliation, being able to identify a series of 
processes, one being building understanding, building relationships, um, acknowledging language or tools or structures. So that can be something like procurement policies or Indigenous entrepreneurship days or um, acknowledge land acknowledgements or um, how the region acknowledges the treaty. There's numerous pathways in terms of what that looks like. And what I'm seeing in the corporate realm is the emergence of uh, Indigenous, like corporate-based um, economic reconciliation planning. So bringing that plan into visibility and accountability and measures. So whether, whether that's like um, staffing, workforce development, policy, inclusion mechanisms, those aspects, those are all going to be distinct to your region and what you set out to do and the importance of that relationship. Sense. And you're talking about economic reconciliation and you mentioned procurement and, um, you know, we're working to advance the, the calls to action. I know that's something you mentioned in the toolkit as well, those 94 calls to action and, and one of those being call to action 92, which is um, um, economic reconciliation, that call to action there. And, and while the TRC has made that really the domain of the business uh, uh, community, the municipality sees uh, um, municipal applications to that call to action and uh, specifically as it relates to Indigenous procurement and, and the role that that has in supporting economic growth and development in local Indigenous communities. So given that you're a leader in the conversation around economic reconciliation, an advisor to many businesses and uh, nations and governments, what would you say to specifically municipal governments in Canada looking to work towards a community uh, that has realized economic reconciliation. How can we make this uh, actually a reality and not just a conversation? There's a number of dynamics that I would suggest. The first is, I, I referred to this earlier, is educating. So going, embarking on a collective process of education. The second part to that is listening. How is it that nations experience this current relationship and being in a leadership space that allows to listen rather than taking positions of rights or wrongs or cans and cannots and the historical baggage of the relationship, but to really create the space for listening the other is creating a principled approach in the sense of what you value to be able to articulate what you value in the relationship and bring that into visibility to uphold so how we value that i see is something in my work that i've seen municipalities and regions take on how they drive the language the narrative and what is valued in the relationship um, and then the other is we're seeing that um, increasing Indigenous roles, bridging that relationship. Uh, so whether that, you know, whether it's facilitating regional development, facilitating uh, sacred space in terms of nations perspectives, whatever that is, creating the role that acts as a bridge to serve in terms of that active listening and relationship building uh, overall. So kind of the the humanity behind the economic conversation, that relationship piece is really fundamental. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a couple more minutes for some questions and there's one that uh, came through uh, the chat there and it's uh, given, you know, we're in the north here uh, in and our the region municipality were Buffalo near Fort McMurray and uh, Resource development is one way that Indigenous communities in the region here have gotten a seat at the economic table, as you put it, but sometimes that does conflict with Indigenous worldviews. Uh, how can we better balance the two? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that we look at examples of the Wood Buffalo Park, those structures of inclusion of Indigenous stewardship is a balance where Indigenous narratives around 
uh, risk management from an indigenous perspective rather than an external regulatory or external authority. Inclusion of risk management, sustainability, stewardship that supports also resource development. And I think those two can't be separated. Okay. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, so I guess we're going to wrap up here pretty quick. We, we are coming near the end, but I wanted to ask you one last question. And it's something we ask um, many of the speakers, but what does true reconciliation, and I know this is a tough question to kind of put into like a short response, but what is true recon, or maybe it's not, I don't know. What does true reconciliation look like in your mind, Caroline? That's a great question. I think true reconciliation as an outcome creates a positive shift in the lived realities of Indigenous people, whether that's increased employment, increased well-being, um, increased access to opportunity, um, truth, weighted equally in the relationship of acknowledging and upholding of what happened uh, historically. And I think the last part of that, again, I referred to that as upholding the leadership of what you value in the relationship. Right. And I think, yeah, you said if it doesn't do that, then it's not reconciliation, right? I think that was a comment in the book. So thank you so much. Before we uh, close out with a prayer, I do want to let everybody who's on uh, the uh, call here tonight that if you want to pick up a copy of your own uh, uh, book of Indigenomics, you can find it on shelves online or in bookstores or through the publisher newsociety.com. The audio book is also available for download and you can find that on Audible or wherever you listen to your audio books. Um, oh, it's also um, the only signed copies available right now in the pandemic is carolinehilton.com. That's the only place you can sign copies. CarolineHilton.com. So oh, thank you for that. Um, we're going to thank you so much, Caroline, for your time this evening and for sharing your work with us and, and coming and visiting us, even if it's virtually right now. Um, and thank you to everybody on, on the call tonight for taking the time to uh, come join us as well. Um, I do want to uh, go back over to Allison if, to close us out this evening with a prayer. Naskamon, Caroline, if you would just join me for a prayer, closing prayer this evening. Creator, we are grateful for the connection with our family and friends here tonight. Please help us to walk and travel together with love in our hearts. Help us to be kind and care for each other. Help us to find words and actions to help each other every day. All my relations. Can I ask something? Thank you, Allison. Thanks, so Thank you, everyone. This has been It's Time to Talk, an Indigenous speaker series, and we'll see you again soon with our next speaker in the spring. Thank you. Marcy Joe. Hi, hi. Good night.